what would you do, James, if you were confronted with an adversary of that scale? Well, there there are a few options. Uh, one of which, is, of course, is just point blank killing. Good luck on trying. <laughs> this guy survived a thousand years of war. You know, it's just that people tend not to look at biology and the significance of matter and what that means for the Gnostics, what it meant for the Cathars, what it means for the alchemists, and what it meant really for Jung. He displayed it all, but people just miss the point, and they go after his psychology, his peculiar, and it was peculiar because it was so individual, his peculiar psychology. Because the animus is a deaf demon too. But that's a, that, yeah. that's a deal that, that are in, yeah. in a way that a woman makes with herself on the inside that she knows that and yeah. she knows the, the inherent dangers but she, she extracts, if you like, yes. that which is positive yeah. out of it yeah. uh, to use in a discriminatory way that, yeah. that will strengthen her and, and, and enhance her judgment and the decisions that she makes in the outer world on her own behalf and on behalf of, of other people too, very often. Human beings are very, very strange things. You know, from a Darwinian perspective, we might like to think that we're all well adapted or designed to be well adapted to the outside world. But through Jungian psychology and psychodynamics and things like that, I've come to realise there are some things within us that aren't necessarily good for us, at least not obviously good for us. One of those things is that tendency for the what's often labelled as negative anima or animus to come out and to, to take you away from the world. And here's an interesting frame for you. If we frame the anima and the animus as the relating function, then you might think that a poorly developed anima or animus takes you away from relating completely to yourself and to other people. And that's certainly true. But on top of that, maybe you're relating to something else. Maybe you end up relating to that negative anima or to the negative animus. It's as if there is a jealous lover or an evil witch, depending on your gender, of course, within you that wants you. Every so often it comes out, but it wants you all to itself. And we might think that these feelings are just random feelings of self-hatred, self-destruction, or these things are just random misfiring in the brain or depression or anything else like that. But there does seem to be this tendency to have somebody claim you on the inside all for themselves. It's a weird, weird thing. Of course, we're going to be continuing our recent conversations on the anima and the animus today using Lilith, the book which Stephen Pauline, or the trilogy of books and the trilogy of film scripts Stephen Pauline have written as our jumping off point for that. And in particular, the animus. Not just for women either. It's also useful for men to understand these things because it's how we will appear in the mind or the perception of women. And so we're going to begin by talking about the, we could say this, the secondary protagonist, I guess, or the apparent antagonist maybe, of the Lilith story, which is the, the, the animus character, if you like, called Von Hess. So Steve, in the past, I know you can hear me. Can you tell us a little bit about Von Hess and then perhaps how that can illustrate really nicely how the animus operates in a woman and how that masculine spirit, that ancestral spirit, could operate through men? Maximilian Von Hess, the Bavarian, who isn't a Bavarian, and that's not his real name. Um... As we progress over the two uh, following instalments of uh, Lilith, we, we see his true backstory, but it's important at this stage to understand what he represents with respect to the animus. He's not present in Eden, and in the novel he turns up first in the 17th century, uh, in the middle of a war, basically, an actual historical battle that took place in the city of Liverpool, the siege of Liverpool. There are important details about him which mean he is very, very different from all the other men that all of the women encounter in the story. He's very old. Um, essentially, he's an alchemist. And he's already had an augmented lifespan as a result of his studies of hermeticism and uh, other forms of mysticism as well. So this is a man who's lived for a very, very long time and as such is distilled. He's distilled with respect to his intellect, with respect to his skills, military skills, um, and also with respect to his character and you could say his individuation. He has a single-mindedness of purpose, which is that he will be the chosen one for Lilith. 
Now, as far as the, the novel's concerned, we encounter him after he's already had other adventures with Lilith. The, these are hinted at. Um, and he is responsible for her reanimation in the 17th century in England during the English Civil War. No pun intended. No, no pun intended, but it, it is a civil war of, of yes, course, of course. sorts, because yeah. individuation is a battle and it does involve mm. mixing the elements in an alchemical sense between light and dark. So, yeah, thanks for pointing mm. that out. That, that is a mm. very important part of the story. In effect, then, he is giving birth to Lilith indirectly because of how he brings about her reanimation. But that's part of his role. And when you think about it, one of the the functions of the animus as an archetype is to perform a function like that inside the unconscious of a woman. Lilith, of course, is no ordinary woman. And her own quest is to find her new Adam, the same Adam that she believes that she's experienced in Eden. This was the fully formed adult man-child, if you like, with respect to his consciousness of the version of the biblical Adam that we see in the allegory of Lilith, the last temptation of Adam. So, in other words, she's looking for an original primordial basic man who is prepared to commit completely to her. Everything's in place. He's an adult, so therefore capable of a, a full adult relationship to a woman. But she's not really looking for somebody like Von Hess, at least not consciously. This man, as I say, is distilled alchemically through a process of self-transformation. He started out as a mortal man, but because of his own work and his own development, it's resulted in several transformations. The changes in him physically are he's actually now a very, very good-looking man. That just happens to be a byproduct of it, but essential also for the story. He's taller than average, dark, mysterious, an accomplished warrior, an accomplished scientist, a man of great wisdom and a skill. But he's also somebody who suffers fools, not at all, not in any way. Anybody who gets in his way, if they become too much of an inconvenience, will be removed. This is his single-mindedness of purpose. All he actually lives for is to nurture Lilith in whatever reincarnation or incarnation she happens to be in to a point where she will finally recognise him as the only possible human being, the only possible human male who could be her consort. No one else could match him, he believes. And he's worked really hard at this for a long time. Yes, he's seen her get herself into unnecessary trouble over and over again down the centuries, which has meant that her plans and his plans and his <laughs> efforts are continually forestalled. So he has had to develop a great deal of patience, at least with her. She, on her part, toys with him. Because he's not that naive young man she met in Eden. This is something else. This is something which has immense potential in terms of the animus as an archetype in relation to her. So she allows him to form the impression that he will be her consort, but she has to have her little adventures along the way. Teases him, humiliates him, uh, forestalls him in all sorts of imaginable ways. And this is the, the archetypal problem that we have. No living human being, no living human male can match this man at all. He's seen it all before, and our story is just another version of what's happened before. But this time, he's absolutely determined that he's going to win through. Um, that means there will be a terrific battle, not just between the men, as they become conscious of who Lilith is, but also between Lilith's animus and Von Hess, as he calls himself at the moment, Von Hess as that archetypal distilled masculine spirit, a human being who is nearly at the level of a demigod himself because of his transformations. And that changes his psychology dramatically in relation to the other men. He's uh, almost something or someone who can't be beaten. An impossible opponent, really, for an ordinary man to overcome, unless Lilith decides that she will back this ordinary young man that she is intent on finding. 
So that's basically the outline of, of what he is as a character. Mm. Well, Lilith has the advantage of having come into creation as a goddess. Yes. Preformed. Yes. Whereas uh, Von Hesse's journey is different, like you say, because yeah. he's he's human yeah. and he's evolved over time, yeah. uh, over hundreds of years. So in, in that sense, he reflects the uh, ancestral, the masculine yes. ancestral spirit yes. as well. The, That's a really good point. the cumulative yeah. experience of of all men, yes. and, and uh, in in that regard, um, I think he he reflects the inner journey mm. for women mm. beautifully. Yes, um, and shows that there can be you, you can use. The, the animus as an interject in order to develop yourself. Yes. Um, and to go through, I mean, hence the you know, the fact that he's an alchemist. I mean, mm. that's, again, that's an important part oh, yeah. of the story because it suggests transformation. Yes. Uh, and, and for women, obviously, the ability to um, perform their own inner alchemy and to transform the masculine on the inside so um they can relate to themselves in a more complete way and and they can relate to outer men in yeah. a more complete way too yeah. it's or a really good really different. really good way of putting it because not only is he uh, a representation of the journey of the ancestral masculine for women this is this is a problem for the guys in the story too for the boyos because in him there is the collective ancestral experience embodied in a living man of every generation that's existed for the past many many hundreds of years mm. that is the kind of guy that you can't compete with the kind of man as another man you just simply can't compete with yeah. on an ordinary level mm. the only way that you could would be if your chosen woman your anima projection this goddess lilith were to choose you over him but when you think about it, that would be a, a really formidable enemy. Somebody who has passed through so many centuries of work and, and self-development. Um, how would we, as young men, those of us who still are, of course, how would we deal with that? How would we compete with a man who has that ancestral memory? And, of course, one of the problems with being young is that young people tend to ignore the wisdom of past generations. Mm. That can be a problem because they spend a couple of decades trying to acquire that as best they can but should that turn up fully formed as a relatively young man in his physical appearance but nevertheless this augmented developed alchemically transformed man who is almost at the level of a demigod himself how on earth can we compete with that particularly when this character will stand no opposition to himself if he gets the slightest indication that any of us say we're a, we're a, com a potential competitor for, for him, then we would disappear and leave no trace. That's the attitude that he has. So there is an archetypal drama there that unfolds. Lilith herself thinks that she wants basically a blank slate, a young man who has all of his instincts intact and who is utterly devoted through projection onto her by this memory that was seeded in Eden of that universal first love that was lost you know dante's beatrice augmented several times that kind of thing which in the story she put into into adam's psyche so every man thereafter would long to find this pure platonic form which is her so in effect then that is the virtual image that's the archetype of the divine feminine the archetype of the anima which men are pre-programmed genetically to find and hopefully to internalize and then relate to in the outer world but just suppose there was someone who was going to get in the way actively not just our own psyche but a real physical man with that amount of power and experience who was determined to stop us that would be one hell of an opponent it would be it would be so in which case what do we do about that well indeed um what would you do james if you were confronted with an adversary of that scale? Well, there, there are a few options. Uh, one of which, is, of course, is just point-blank killing, which would, you know, solve the problem if it's a real hu hu human good luck, good luck on trying. Good luck on trying. <laughs> this guy survived a thousand years of war, you know. Well, you did say that, that um, he wants all other men just out of the way, or all other people out of the way. Kind of suggests a coldness to that person, doesn't it? 
It does. There's, that, that's a good point because there's two kinds of coldness. There's a, there's a coldness that is there without experience of life. It's just an innate flaw in character, which means that there's an absence of anima in, say, a man and an inability to relate either internally or, or externally. And that will be present where it is present in a young man without life experience. How about though if you'd have lived for 900 years, a thousand years, and you just don't want to have to go through this cycle again? Is that coldness or is that distillation? That's a good point. Definitely a good point. Well, and that's what I meant about, about the ancestral memory. If, if, if a young man could tap into the ancestral memory, the entire ancestral memory, consciously of all the previous generations of men and all of their experiences, it would be too much. What you would have to do is to distill that down, and that would be, have to be an alchemical process. Psychologically, you could say it was a dialectic where you would strip away the things that weren't necessary to know, or to internalise, or to understand. But it would definitely be a rationalisation that would involve you trimming right down. Now, then, then this is this is the difference: how you would be on the inside, and how you would be forced to manifest externally would be incongruent, which is apparently going against what I've just said, that what is within is also without. That is normally the case when a person is developing, when a young man's developing, how he relates to his anima on the inside, how he relates to women on the outside is the same thing, pretty much. And it shows the level of development. In this character though, you have someone who is very, very well developed, except he doesn't have the anima in the form of Lilith. You know, he's very, very well developed. So he's reduced down a lot of the things that we might normally be bothered or forced to go through. So his understanding on the inside is hidden, and what you see on the outside is task and goal orientated. Hence he appears to be cold. From his perspective, he's not. He's just been very rational. He would see himself as the ultimate rational man, actually, in the sense that he has worked himself through. But he's reserved this one thing left, which is the true attainment of the platonic form in the form of Lilith. And therefore, everything else has to go. There's nothing else he needs to learn in terms of science, philosophy, anything like that at all. He's competent physically to an extraordinary degree. He's um, psychically developed, psychologically developed, spiritually developed. All of these things, all done, all dusted, bored of it. There is no need to test any of this on the outside. So then any other man who gets in the way is just going to just going to be just pushed out of the way. If they don't bother him, he's not bothered. But if they do, they have to be dealt with. And that's the single mindedness of purpose that he has. And what that then produces with respect to Lilith is the ultimate weaponized animus for her to just deploy whenever it amuses her to do so. But for her, her flaw is that she was imprinted on anima, sorry, on um, Adam in Eden in that primitive, undeveloped, youthful form. So she's looking for that again, even though she has this incredibly augmented animus figure, her guardian, her protector, earthly protector. Because there are times when Lilith is vulnerable on, on Earth, you know, and, and this is a, a result of what happened to her when she was banished from Eden and then the fact that she decided not to go back to the Pleroma but to stay in material creation so that set her physical vulnerability which is alchemically worked on in each incarnation she has until she is then strong enough to release her fatal contagion and choose the young boy that she wants to be her Adam meanwhile her constant companion her dark servant who calls himself von Hess at the moment is continually updating and upgrading and upscaling his own ability and he is now in a position potentially to challenge her if he can't have her he'll stop anybody having her that's his recessed belief and spirit about himself he partitions his mind to hide that last plan so that Lilith even Lilith can't find it in his heart he believes she can see through him but he, he believes that he's so capable, so distilled now, nobody can find that. He can just partition the hard drive, hide it in there, it's not there. So she continues to play with him. He's useful. And that's the way the drama starts and begins to unfold. She's looking for this young man who is physically complete, he's capable of reproduction, but he has a lower level of consciousness, certainly than the Von Hess character. 
and he will devote himself completely to her which was the first temptation of Adam as such in Eden in this story that he was tempted with ultimate integration with, with the anima and an increase in consciousness to the level of being a god himself by blending with her or choosing the inferior copy Eve so in that sense you can see the psychodrama that's unfolding behind it yes so uh, maybe you should answer that initial question then what, what, what does a man do now, because my stance on that would be you don't compete. Because if, if if the game is set up that you can't win, you don't compete. So it's, yeah, of course we, you don't you don't know that. Yeah, I mean this is the unfortunate thing when when the men in the in the uh, in the story encounter von Hess, they react to him according to what they can understand, which is that this is just a physical man who is in the way or is a, is a threat and has to be dealt with, and then they find out they can't beat him. The only way they can they could beat him is to get Lilith. And if, if Lilith chooses them, then they're bulletproof, literally, and, and bulletproof spiritually as well. There's nothing at that point Von Hess can do, but they have to prove themselves to the anima that this dark force can't get to them. And that's all part of what you've uh, prosaically called shit testing, as in the cultural uh, norm that's, or meme that's going around at the moment. She, she, shit, she shit tests everybody to see whether they would be capable of at least standing up to Von Hess in the belief that they love her that much that they would risk themselves to that extent and then would completely adore and worship her, which is what she wants. It's slightly off topic then, you're talking about shit testing. Could could we consider then the negative anima to be a shit test? The, those, those internal moods basically to say, if I, if I can take you down, you're not worthy. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's... it's um, Shift testing fundamentally is reproductive in intent. If you can stand up to that and uh, assert yourself, then you're displaying your masculinity to a point where mm. you say, I'm not having this. Mm. Mm. And Lilith shit tests Von Hess, <clears throat> but he realises the stakes are so high, he has to play a game rather than stand up directly to her. Um, it's so the clever way to do it. It's the clever way to do it. Mm. Um, the culture at the moment is in a terrible state, mm. a, a really reductive state. Yeah. Uh, there are all sorts of forces which unfortunately are Darwinian, and I don't mean that in any political sense of favouring that, mm. or you know, I, I wouldn't want to be misinterpreted in that way, but it's just a fact there are Darwinian forces which are at work here beneath the cultural zeitgeist at the moment, which are putting selective pressures on men, young men, in the West in particular, to see if they will stand up to this. And if they don't, then Darwinian selection will select against them. That's obvious. You know, the, the correlates are everywhere in the natural world. Hmm. Um, psychologically and psychoculturally, how this present generation of young men adjust to that is crucial for them. And uh, only time is going to tell about how that will work itself through. Yeah, okay, because then I can come up with... Uh, well, the negative anima in particular is a strange thing, because it, why would it exist? Apart from the idea of saying, well, the positive anima exists, and therefore, by necessity, you need to have an opposite to that, because the psyche seems to be governed by opposites. But if the negative anima is an internal shit test, then you can make a good Darwinian case that even before a real human female might shit test you, her inside you would also shit test you. So, so from the moment you sort of come of age, you're constantly in a war against sort of that inner Darwinian spirit. So it's quite a... It's before quite a, then, before yes. then. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Paul, you're going to say... I was just going to add to that, and it's true for the animus as well as the anima, is that they, the anima is a jealous lover. The animus is a jealous lover. So, you know, they they want you so, literally, and um, they they want to possess you. So the idea of being challenged by a real outer woman or a real outer man is a problem that has to be negotiated. Mm. Well, all of this is, is prepared for in, in the genome. Yeah. And the testing begins for, for young children uh, of either sex almost immediately. Even <clears> if you, you take in what Freud called the latency period, you know, in his stages of psychosexual development. And to step away from that, having just said it now, I basically mean that that period before puberty. Uh, there, there are still rumblings of this 
between children of the opposite sex they're interested in one another it's not completely latent not completely gone and of course things can happen between young children or sadly between adults and young children which can muddy the waters considerably so we're being prepared all the time for this uh, as we uh, as we grow and that is in the genome it's in our in our genetics mm. and then when it kicks in hormonally it's because it's been triggered by the genes and then of course you're at the age where all the, the, the psychosocial changes start to happen as well so it's a universal story that's prefigured at the beginning and then releases itself through the various stages of life on the subject of shit testing and why would it work well uh, why is it set that way well when you say for example that the psyche works in opposites it, it's mm -hmm. easy to see opposites even when they're not actually there because there may just be a continuum between two extreme poles which a limited form of uh, aggressive consciousness will identify like you might say on off black white whatever as, t as terms of opposites and then say that energy exchanges and information exchanges according to a concentration gradient perhaps between those two poles that's just an easy and even lazy form of discriminative consciousness so when we, we talk about the bipolarity say inside the anima or the animus that just makes it easy to see but there are subtle nuances across the whole of that bandwidth and that's where people fall down in real life as opposed to in psychological theory so yes there is a negative animus and there is a negative anima but sometimes they function positively you just make a value judgment in the moment and say that this is negative but unless you understand the context in which this is playing through you can't really say whether it's positive or negative, or what the purpose of that counter dynamic is. Absolutely, there is a homeostatic function, obviously, there is, between the extremes, but to be conscious only of the extremes is to miss the entirety of the story. This is where the subtleness and discrimination comes from. The people who are more conscious and more experienced in life should be able to see. And that's where collective wisdom from past generations comes in that when we're young we do need to learn from the past but usually there's this hubris of course which says that you don't need to that you're the only one having this experience and that you go out there and you find everything and it's all new when it isn't and this is the problem if you like for a young man potentially facing an incarnate archetypal character like von hess he's seen it all many many times over therefore he is very very focused on achieving his goals even if he doesn't threaten an individual man he's a threat just because he exists you know it, in other words whatever woman he were to choose he would get if he wanted as it happens no woman's good enough for him unless it's Lilith because he's evolved to that level where hmm. now there is only Lilith for him but for young men their, hmm. their starting point could be so much sooner if they look to the past yes indeed yeah yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good point. But when they don't... So you don't have to necessarily see youth as being a disadvantage. It's not it, a disadvantage, no. no. It's a necessary biological phase. It's, and it has its, its dialectic, which means that some adaptations are more to the front, more to the fore, because they will benefit either society as a whole mm. through natural selective processes, such as the young men tend to be the warriors, the soldiers, and so forth. Um, and that increases the fitness of the population as a whole all of those factors are there but they don't have direct experience of wisdom but as Pauline has just said there is an ancestral psyche lads and you can tune into this you can do it and one of the problems is that if you look and we've discussed this before if you look to contemporary should we say man of personalities or gurus or whoever to find a medium for that ancestral memory and you pick the wrong one yeah. or a number of wrong ones in succession you're going to be misled because what is the state of the psyche of the person that you are following that's like the O'Reilly character it's like the O'Reilly character in the story really? yeah yes. um, in, in the story is an example of this <laughs> someone thanks Paul mm. who on the surface appears to be yeah. fully formed yeah uh, and uh, for the sake of the story he's a young analyst and he's approaching the late life transition as Jung would have <coughs> understood it and because of his life experience in this life 
then he appears to be complete. If you like, the incarnation of the wise old man, but he is not complete. It's an illusion. Mm -hmm. He doesn't set out to mislead other people, but he misleads himself because he's misunderstood his own progress. And he's done that by almost thinking that his own path is the path. You mm. know? And he has forgotten his ancestors, literally forgotten them, become unconscious of them. And that then means that he's vulnerable in that particular way to Lilith and she just targets him straight away. Yeah. And then gets right inside. Mm. And this is part of the hero cycle process again because we have to go through this continuously. It's not just a young man or a young woman mm. who goes through Into this. Into old age. Into old age. Every ad ad uh, adaptive change you have to make, you go through that process again. So yeah, th th there's an example. Uh, and so again, it's with like young or a youngian, whoever mm. that might be, or anyone else. If you choose to follow them, make absolutely sure that what you're getting from them is clean. Because insofar as it might not be, then their shadow, if you like, their shadow will cast shade over you and that light from ancestral learning will be blocked and will not illuminate you in your life. Mm. So be very, very careful. Mm. How do you do that then? How do you access this ancestral spirit? Well, Plato had an answer for that. Anamnesis, all knowledge is remembering. <laughs> there is a way, there is a way of accessing this, but you do still have to live that life too. You can't just live inside. Uh, inside a transcendent meditative state using active imagination or any other method like that you can have a glimpse of this ancestral memory and spirit but you do have to pressure test it out in the world so this story is an allegory of various attempts at trying to achieve that when confronted with the ultimate wholeness of the archetypal feminine and also of the archetypal masculine as it works itself through as a, as a case study. So think of Von Hess as a case study. He appears to be bad from the point of view of the other men, but that's a competitive view of a, a man that you can't compete with. From his perspective internally, he's the good guy. He's not evil, he's just distilled. Yeah, but also from the, the perspective of the animus. Which is very important. Within the yeah, woman too. Absolutely, because, please explain. Well, that, because yeah. that kind of um, distillation um, is important in a, in a woman's psyche and also to in, in terms of how she relates to men I mean like you say it, it just depends what kind of a, a spin you put on things I mean there are times in a woman's life where she might need to I don't know cut loose from a situation um, that is toxic in some way and she might need that singularity of mind in order yeah. to do that and to literally cut away all the um, the, the, the fictions that might pre yeah. prevent her from doing so. Mm. And then to employ someone like Von Hess, if you're like on the inside in order to do that, yeah. could be very useful. Absolutely, absolutely. And he, as an archetype, even though he's a human, he's so distilled he's become one, he's lost in many respects his individuality. There is an interject that the women who encounter him could usefully use except that he is terrifying because if he doesn't choose that specific mm. woman then that specific woman has no future and if you think about it that's the animus is a deaf demon because mm. the animus is a deaf demon too but that's a that, um, that's a deal that, that in, yeah. in a way that a woman makes with herself on the inside that she knows that and yeah. she knows the, the inherent dangers, but she she extracts, if you like, yes. that which is positive yeah. out of it yeah. uh, to use in a discriminatory way that, yeah. that will strengthen her and, and, and enhance her judgment and the decisions that she makes in the outer world yeah. on her own behalf and on behalf of, of other people too, very often. So yeah. it, it's, it's always a bit of a balancing act. Mm, it is. So that, that's that's really really well explained. So in, in the sense then of um, how do you think the women would re well you do know but the women themselves those individual women are going to react to the different men in this story and the different levels of development. You, mm. You've got the uh, the wise old man in the form of the young analyst. Uh, you, you've got the man of action John Sutton who is practical, mm. um, first up to the fight, you yes. know, traditional guy. Yes. Uh, you've got the young boy banders types. You've got the the young student types uh, who, uh, in one case, one is a PhD student. And you've got an artist as well, a creative yes. man. 
Um, you've got all of these things going on, and you've got Von Hess circling around in that, mm. and then this uh, this femme goddess as well, who is therefore more complete than any of the women in the character in the, in the narrative. So there's a heck of a lot of alchemy going on there. Mm. So how, how do you think the women would react then to the prospect of relating to to a man like him? Oh wow! Um, <laughs> wow. I, do, I don't. Uh, yeah. Well, in uh, terms of the other men in the story, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think they stand a chance against Von Hess. They wouldn't know on any no. level, intellectually, spiritually, no. physically, nothing. No. You know, no. Game over, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, yeah, um, I mean uh, that's probably not very helpful in a way because that's a kind of an end point, isn't it? But um, yeah, I mean I, I'm reminded even uh, just coming away from the story for a moment of something that we discussed mm. yesterday with a gentleman we, we were together yeah, yeah. discussing, yeah. and I think it was um, it's a real life example of how some of these things can operate, and um, he was uh, he's. Um, in his 50s this guy and he was attempting I guess to help his wife with uh, her development and he he had I guess for him one of the problems in his re relationship is that he don't doesn't like to be told what to do uh, which you could say is um, a negative aspect of the animus coming out and, and you know bullying a, a, a real man and um, he would normally react to that very badly, understandably, because this is what the, you know, the anima and the animus do to one another when they're mm. operating in that way. They kick one another off at a, at a very kind of low level of relating. Uh, and on this occasion, he chose to deal with things differently. And that created change in her. And what he did, I, I think, was actually... Um, a stroke of genius actually in so much as his wife was trying to organize something um in the family an event in the family and normally she would expect him to kind of deliver on the practical side of that to be the the man of action if you like to take the initiative and to do all the planning and to make that thing happen and she was on this occasion she was asking him to do these things and was kind of putting it to him in a in an animacy way unfortunately but rather than reacting badly he approached it really warmly and got her to a position where she realized w w probably without even having to talk about it that she should be doing those things for herself and that she could actually make those things happen make those changes uh in the world herself and and uh i'm not really doing it justice really in, in describing it in this way but it because it was an in the moment thing and he took the moment and like i say he just he dealt with it beautifully because in 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 being warm with her in not reacting to what she was doing badly he set up a situation where she couldn't resist him or she couldn't resist the, the suggestions that he was about to make and that just took all the heat out of it and in that moment she learned something about her own capacity to do what he would normally do on her behalf mm. and they both grew from that mm. and I, I just think that's a wonderful thing that's a real life of experience uh, of it in action and, and how it can work in um, in a marriage situation but obviously you know in other situations as mm. well yeah, that's uh, th yeah, that that, that was uh, was quite a moment. It we, was we, a we moment. Both, uh, we both witnessed this. Yes. And yeah, you're right. There is a as a practical way of uh, yeah. of looking at it. Mm. Uh, in, in the context of of the story, the way I've described von Hess uh, as he calls himself at the moment, in, in part one of the Lurth trilogy, defines him as we first encounter him. But over the following two books and scripts to follow on mm. from that we actually do see him change as a result of what happens in the first one mm. so as distilled and refined as he thinks he is we then start to find the last glimmer of of potential for development within him and he does change and therefore the the story is an opus of development mm. von hess is one-sided because he has excluded integration of the feminine in the first story he's hyper masculine in that sense 
He's not um, a huge bodybuilding type guy, though. There's elements of that there in the sense that he is really physical and, and achieved in that sense. But he's not one-sided that way. He's balanced it with the intellect. The intellect, the physical, the spiritual, the psychic, as well as the psychological. What's really missing is his true relationship to the feminine. And that's why Lilith has a little bit of a problem with him. She's trapped too because she's looking for that archetypal, basic, original man that was represented in Eden by Adam. And he's too developed for that. He's well beyond it. Mm -hmm. So she's, she's still looking for that pristine quality. Hence, she's looking for a young man rather than a man who's that old, although he appears to be about 35, I would say. The way, certainly the way he's been, he's been, uh, he's been written. Mm. But because of what happens over the course of the first story, then during the second, he realises, he finally understands he has to change. And then in the third, then we see the real alchemical union that occurs and how those characters are pulled through those three stages. But of course, when you change yourself, even when Von Hess changes, that causes ripples and it causes effects. And some of those effects aren't just personal and they're not just immediately social. You can say that a compensation for that change would occur within the psyche broadly. Particularly if somebody were that well developed, you would expect that to happen. And that does happen. So something else is brought into play in the second installment and then the confrontation fully occurs in the third so he can finally integrate himself so everything's about development and adaptation at particular times so we, we find him very very well developed but still not quite there that gives him the energy for development like you say they're all all, all the characters are developing regardless yeah. of where they're at yeah and and in the example I gave, I guess I was thinking of somebody like the John Sutton character, yeah. who was a practical man, a man yes. of action. Yes, yeah, yeah, he is, uh, and uh, that's his strength and it's his weakness. Uh, and it's the same with the uh, the dreamy art student who recognises Lilith because he's an artist, and if an artist looks into their soul and finds the virtual image, they'll see her. And he did, mm -hmm. but he was too young. And therefore, that cast of mind of being a young man and the distractions that that causes biologically meant that he didn't really see what he was encountering, not only positively, but also negatively. And anyway, he wasn't Adam. He was just one of them, one of the potential holographic representations of Adam that all of us as men do mm -hmm. allegorically. We all carry that original spark in us but can we really access this and see it? And in the first story, she's, she will recognise him by a signature heartbeat or rhythm that's absolutely unique. Uh, and that's what she does. And Von Hess apparently doesn't have it, but she does find this new Adam, uh, and that causes a problem, of course. So from the perspective of, uh, of the animus, then, this, this is a different emphasis than we put on on the earlier podcast, the one before this, which had to do with the anima, which is really where Pauline comes in because she can discuss the animus in an authentic way that I couldn't. You know, it's more for me. It's to do with theory on the one hand, and then also how, as a man, I've affected women in my life. That that and how women have told me through working with me psychotherapeutically how the animus works. But mm. it normally will take a woman to understand the animus in a way that a man can't. But as men, collectively, all of us, we do need to make the effort because if we don't, we have no idea how we're affecting women. And we can't make the alchemical union on the inside if we don't prepare our own masculinity to receive the archetypal feminine. What, what do you think on, on that overall? Well, I think you're right about the... Um, I mean, all, all the Adams in the story are essentially the same yeah. young man, aren't they? Yes. With a, with a few sort of descriptive yes. changes w yeah. which uh, tend to sort of be based on, on their appearance yeah. almost as yeah. a, opposed to anything else. Yeah. Um, and whilst, like you say... Um, Lilith is, you know, drawn towards him to choosing her Adam. There's no way that they can ever. I mean, she's just toys with them. Yeah. They can never yeah. be enough. No. For her. No. 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 And uh, that's the human side of things. That the parallel process, if you like, is that 
Adam in the three incarnations of him in the, in the first story each of them meets Eve reincarnated too as the ordinary woman the real woman the material woman who is nevertheless a holographic projection of the original Eve and at first Eve isn't enough because this particular Adam is looking for Lilith albeit he's unconscious of it at first so he's looking for the divine feminine for the platonic form and that distracts him from being able to have a real relationship which is, of course, is the consequence of the drama in Eden that Adam did settle for a mortal woman, an ordinary woman, which, as men, we have to do if we're yes. going to have a real life yes. and not a life of fantasy. Mm. But the presence of fantasy in the form of the archetype is real and it plagues us. It plagues us unconsciously, if not consciously. Women go through the same thing with the archetypal animus as well, hence von Hess. Mm. So... The, the drama of Eden is acted out again, particularly in the final part of this first story, um, and hence the last temptation of Adam, as such, where he has to choose again, and now the stakes are incalculably mm. higher even than they were originally. And um, if you follow the story, you'll see how it unfolds, but it is a proper psychodrama of lifespan development, individuation, anima and animus, both of them, and the hero cycle as well. You've read it, James. What do you think? Uh, I think it's the most important material people need to consume. I, I mean that actually with sincerity. So out of all of the, you know, obviously different stage of life than you two. Um, but out of all the, all the material I have ever encountered, on Jung, on the anima, on the animus, on, on anything that actually matters in this domain, this story is the most important thing I've encountered. And, um, it's where it's where it's at, James, isn't it? It it's not the shadow. No. It, it it it's it's anima and animus. That that's that's where you know the battleground is. That that's where yeah. um you know the battle can be won and often is won, but it but it's a very painful battle as well. Yeah, I'm at risk of going on like a serious rant, which I'll try and refrain from, but. Obviously, people who watch videos like this are seeking something. They're either lost or they're suffering, they're in pain. And people have sincerely been led astray by people who claim to want to deliver them from that suffering. But it does all come down really to the anima and the animus. And the biggest frame shift that you guys talk about relative to I've seen anyone else talk about on these topics is you link it to like biological reproduction at the same time. You bring in the biology. So then then you can trust it, first of all, as being real. And that's really what we're all looking for, is is that. So like, if someone was to ask me in, in the street, as one does, you know, where's where should I begin on a journey of self-development like this? Um, I would say Lilith. In, in all sincerity, I would. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is a powerful mm. story. Um and I do know of a young analyst who actually issues it like a prescription in, in America to people uh, because she's found it, it to be that effective. I didn't consciously write it like that, though, uh, to get back into the creative stuff. Uh, well, yeah, of course, I, I had the information and, and I'd lived it for decades, but I didn't consciously put it together that way. I trusted mm -hmm. the psyche to come through and just tell me how the story should be written. Mm -hmm. In that sense, it's not mine. It's not my creation just a medium for it it's definitely something that came from somewhere else um but what you have done steve i think mm. is you you've updated it and so much you've you've got you've put all the nuances in which are often missing yes and and, and often missing from traditional stories even you know yeah. that that help to explain some of these things yeah. because all all your characters are on a journey so yes. you know there's always someone in there that you can maybe identify yeah. with yeah as opposed to just thinking that there's just going to be um you know two main characters mm. and they're the ones to focus on yeah so in that yeah. way it may it opens it up for people to it, yeah i, I, I think it does it i think themselves. it does those characters i think that you, you meant are real people actually they're real people i've known they're in my family mm -hmm. they're aspe aspects of my own life and development yeah. uh, other people i've worked with yeah you know clinically and or in terms of uh, personal mm -hmm. developments mm -hmm. and in that sense they're all real yeah and uh what can go wrong but what can go right too mm -hmm. and uh 
it really stands out. It, it stood out to me for, um, for both of us for a long time that archetypes are two things which are overlooked. They're biological. Yeah, that's not reductive, you know. That that's that's the substance mm. of reality that we live in in a day-to-day -day sense. And also, they are narratives. Because we live in a narrative, we have a personal narrative. It's the context of our life as it unfolds. And the minute you reduce them to these non-playable characters and take them out of that context, mm. you don't understand them anymore. Because mm. they're not meant to be understood out of a context. Yeah. Plus they become polarised in the way that James was yes. describing earlier. Yes, they do. And, and that, that's, that's the reductionism. It is. It's to turn things into polarities. When it's the dynamics of the interplay between the opposites, the dynamics mm. is where everything is at. Yes, yeah, where the alchemy is. It's, it's, yeah, it is. That, that's the energy of process and transformation. It is not the polarity, it is the dynamic. The polarity is concrete. Mm. And that's a huge trap, for example, for thinking types because they like to think in terms of polarities, just like you know, Western rational philosophy going right the way back to, the, to, to Greece had a tendency to generate that kind of conception of things. And you get it in China as well, although you do also get the interplay between those mm. opposites. And Buddhism, of course, abhors opposites and looks for the transcendent position and so forth. All of those things are stated, but people still, if they're influenced by Jung, and I will go as far as to say in the wrong way, influenced by him they start to look for opposites everywhere mm -hmm. and all you're doing then is narrowing consciousness real experience is both emotional and factual in other words you could say feeling as it relates to emotion as well as just evaluation and then real experience is that as that is sensing they're two functional opportunities qualities that you can experience the world through that if you run through thinking and intuition are relatively unconscious to you or, and therefore unavailable of course people who think or experience the world through those functions are also missing other things as well so mm -hmm. the alchemy is in the blending of all of them when they are appropriate to use so the characters in the story have all different types all different types and they all have problems and they all have positives and they articulate through the narrative because that's what we do. We all have a narrative, we have a context. Mm -hmm. And again, Jungians, because the, the majority of them are introverted, their energy withdraws from culture, so they undervalue the psychosocial side yeah. of things. The confirmation bias in that direction, isn't yes, it? Yes, the confirmation bias is definitely in that, in that direction. I asked a question the other day about Jung on, on, on the Discord, and I'm looking for a specific reductive decontextualized nuance, but it's one that's not looked at very often, so I thought I should offer it and see if people would respond to it. I said, why do you think that Carl Jung created the concept of the self, you know, the archetypal self? And then I said, why do you think he had to? And the responses I got were all sincere and genuine and well thought through, absolutely, in terms of it being rational. But you put it into the context of Carl Jung, he'd have gone insane had he not done it. His concept of the self arose out of his <clears throat> creative illness. That's when he started creating mandalas and his yeah. red book and all the yeah. rest of it. And, and all these notions of the idea of a still sense to balance the fact that his ego was fragmenting. Mm -hmm. He had to do it. Mm -hmm. Why then is that concept psychologically absent in every other school pretty much of psychology? It just isn't there. And some people say, oh, it's in the concept of the Tao in Taoism or the Buddha or Christ or whatever. Yes, you can project that into that. But does that actually describe it? We, we're still left with the fact that the man, this man created the concept and elevated it. Bear in mind, he's an introvert or was an introvert with a specific bias. Yeah. And what you got then was an, an ego, an ego consciousness that was fracturing and needed to become whole. And because he was introverted, he projected that inwardly to find a second sensor, a second ego, second sensor to the personality that would provide the reflection of wholeness in a psychological sense that would balance his ego and prevent it from fracturing. That doesn't mean to say it's really there. Really important to understand. That doesn't mean to say that it's not there. But the question was, why did he do it? Why did he need to do it? 
then pretty much everything he did after that was built around that idea that he'd apparently discovered this thing that was a psychological center to the personality. Well, where does that come from? Well, people started to equate that with God. Which God? Well, of course, a monotheistic God. Which monotheistic God? And it's the Christian one, because all of that fits into Carl Jung's personal myth. Mm. His myth of meaning and understanding about himself. But then he denied it, of course, and said, well, no, not really. It's, it's just that, you know, the idea of God is an archetype. So he brings his archetypal hypothesis in. And then he says, you can't really experience the archetype of the self in itself because it's too big. It's a psychologism. Mm. Of course you can experience it because it appears in consciousness in a mm. psychological form. Whether that's an idea about it or it's an image, an image of the incarnation of the ego in that form or whatever. But what is behind that must be your biological genomic self, the thing that produces psychology. That's the true totality. That if the self is real, projects a psychological image of itself that can potentially meet consciousness. So in that sense, we have to be careful about where we go with things. And it's true of the anima and the animus too, that going back to what you said about grounding it in biology, and also its existence culturally, because the biological grounding includes the ancestral memory. I'm mm. like, yes, I'm going to use that expression. <clears throat> People aren't going to like it. But yes, there is an ancestral memory, because that, that memory is not like a personal memory. It's about conditioning. It's about selective pressures. It's about virtual images. It's about epigenetics. And it's about the genome as a whole. It's about what ethology understands as instinct all of those things. So we encounter the, the animus because of biological triggers when, when it's a woman. And the same with men when they encounter the animus because of biological triggers through lifespan development. Lifespan development is controlled genetically. It's not controlled through the, some psychological self, which is a fiction, a projection of the ego inwardly which is the kind of bias you get from an introverted psychology. And I am an introvert, so I know that. Yes. I had to learn the lesson that culture and society were just as important and were just as determining mm. and were just as selective mm. in a biological sense as anything else. And this is so important, isn't it? Well, to, to, well to it understand. is. The thing that strikes me about everything you've said is for any individual man or woman trying to solve their own personal equation there's mm. no one size fits all no and that and that's why the challenges in, in lilith are different for each person absolutely yeah and you just cannot yeah. generalize no. it out no no we're not saying that the archetypal images and what stands behind them which is biological mm. at the very least perhaps something else perhaps something transcendent we're not saying that, that they're not real. They are real. Those mm. forces are real. And they appear in consciousness mm. and they appear in culture in these symbolic forms that resonate with us on the inside. In that sense, they're absolutely real. To solve the problem of individuation, to solve the problem of what Carl Jung called the anima and the animus, which I prefer to call the relating function because it takes on many, many forms. Mm. A man, for example, can project his anima onto another man if that man is significant in his life. And is drawing his relating, drawing his libido. It doesn't have to be sexual. He just needs to be influential. And that man can be a collective figure, a social figure, a man of personality. Or it can be his brother. Or a reflection psychologically through transference of his brother. It doesn't matter. That man then, oppositely gendered, in the absence of sexuality, can still be an anima projection. And function as an anima introject for good or for mm. bad. Mm. So relating is a very, very important thing to understand. Mm. And uh, this story does cover all of that, certainly over the three parts of it, and you get a proper resolution to it as well, which is important. And between the animus and women too, which is yeah. possibly something which is overlooked as well. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We do need to understand that. We need to understand it on a genetic level too, that it does start at that level, but that is not cold and not unrelating. Mm. That is relating to the mm. world that we live in and that we experience. And that, you know, we are driven, most of us, most of us are driven biologically and it's outside of our conscious will or intention. It does not come from a psychological fiction called the self. It comes from your genome. Mm. It just does. 
and we have to come to terms with that. Yeah, and and even if you've you've to some extent developed other aspects of yourself, I, I have someone in mind, obviously, when I'm saying this. Yeah. Um, and uh, to all intents and purposes, you've, you've you've done a good job of that. If you haven't fulfilled the biological side of things, it will st it will still insist it will. itself. It, yeah. So. Yeah. You know, all of these things are present, yeah, yeah. but they, for people, people being people and, and life generally being messy, mm. they may not get an opportunity, no. say, to express the biological no. side when they're young. No. It might come later yeah. or yeah. vice versa. You, you get yeah. the biological drives over with and then there's a need to develop yourself psychologically. Yes. So it's not clean, is it? It's not, no. you know, ordered or in, no, in that, a particular that's, that's absolutely true and, that, and that's a, a critical insight that you can be misled into thinking that there is a linear sequence mm. uh, in terms of young psychology there pretty much is biologically there's your linear sequence and that's on a time release mechanism from your from your genome as a whole you don't get conscious without that if there's something wrong with the genome you don't develop consciousness at all there's lots of things that don't happen if mm. something goes wrong with the genome mm. and then if something goes wrong psychosocially there's an impediment to that development well, that's right yeah, yeah and, and and I think you're right to emphasise that because sometimes it's not emphasised enough no. that that uh, psychosocial or sociocultural pressures can get in the way massively yeah, of can. people developing themselves. They absolutely can, and this is why it's important to fall back on instincts. And for those who doubt that instincts are important, and, and quote Carl Jung uh, as talking in a way which borders on being woo-woo about mm. archetypes, remember he also said that the archetypes are the self portrait of the instincts if you think about that you know who's the artist then the in the instinct or the archetype if it's the self portrait then the instincts create the archetypes therefore not only are they a, a priori of them but they project them and the archetype that you can experience is only an image can people see that? Can they grasp that in that <clears throat> importance? The human instincts are very, very evolved systems and the archetypes are just extensions of them. And if you try to separate them or fail to understand archetypes in their context, you won't get them at all. You won't get it. You won't understand it. You'll just get lost in, in, in a loop. You'll be in an ego fiction and you won't fulfill your potential. It's hugely important to understand that fact, but people get lost when they follow young. Remember who you were following. You were following somebody who, who pretty much became on the border of insane and then had to self-correct for that. Mm. And he was massively introverted. Yes, he was intelligent and creative. Of and he, he No was one like, denies that, Nobody denies that. But look, look and see what's really there. It could actually be contraindicated for you. Yeah, it could be. To, to assume that path. Yes, it could. Be very, very careful who you follow. If you want the real advice, hook into your instincts. You'll find a massive amount of relaxation then inside yourself. Anxiety will go down yes, and definitely. you'll start to see your path unfold. Mm -hmm. Then your psychology can begin to release itself properly from the genome. Yes. It doesn't come from some fictional ego projection back from the, the rim of your personality no. into an inner mirror where it sees itself in some enlarged form, which is what the psychological self as an image is. It's a bigger ego. That's all it is. But what stands behind that is biology. That's the real fact of life. Mm. Without, without the experience, it's difficult, you see, uh, and, mm. and sometimes you can only mm. pass on that experience by giving examples, which yes. Um, yes. You know, we have to be yes. careful if it's, about that. If it's not appropriate. But if you think about the Lilith story, it starts with two things. The transcendent presence of the feminine principle appearing physically in other words into biology so what i'm suggesting is there then that there might be another layer that is antecedent to biology which you could call spiritual i'm not ruling it out by saying that biology is very important so remember that and then when she instantiates within matter as the feminine principle and that initial drama unfolds it starts as a reproductive jealousy between lilith and eve and rivalry for the man reproductively mm. and then psychology follows on from that and spiritual development follows on from that it's really important in a gnostic sense if you think this idea that we are all divine sparks that really belong with the highest godhead who lives in the pl pleroma beyond this universe is finite bound and we've been trapped here in matter and then forced 
by matter to reproduce and to replicate. That's also a Cathar belief, by the way, those medieval Gnostics also believe that. Then there is no separation between Lilith and the Gnostic and Cathar and alchemical tradition. And that means it's in line with Jung too. It's just that people tend not to look at biology and the significance of matter and what that means for the Gnostics, what it meant for the Cathars, what it means for the alchemists and what it meant really for Jung. He displayed it all but people just missed the point and they go after his psychology, his peculiar, and it was peculiar because it was so individual, his peculiar psychology. And if you do that, you will lose your own context if you're not careful. Yeah, well, it was peculiar because it was peculiar to him. Exactly. That, that's it. It was so individual to him. And yeah, he worked with the, with the anima as a concept and as a construct mm. uh, by referring back to previous examples of what that was and of the animus as well. And he went to alchemy to look at the, the blending of these elements mm. psychologically. Mm. But the allegory in the rosarium is physical. Yeah. But it's, 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 or it's projected into, into physics, into matter. We have to rationalise those two apparent opposites by looking at all the nuances and all of the transformations in between. That gives you the bandwidth to understand what's really going on. So do not neglect biology because you will lose yourself. Or real relationships. Or real relationships. Because Jung yeah. messed up hugely. He did, yeah. When you think about he it, did. with real Massively. women and his Massively. relationship to real women. Yeah. So the Lilith story then is an allegory. There is the transcendence in it. It is in the Gnostic, Cathar, alchemical, uh, Rosarium, Philosophorum Rosarium tradition and in the Jungian tradition, but it does not neglect underneath it all the reality of life and of material life and the fact that we have to live our life yeah. and that we go through transformations that are physical through our lifespan development that are determined by our genome, by our genetics and by our culture rather than just by our egocentric psychology. And when those challenges come to us, they come at all of those levels simultaneously. Therefore, you have to address them at all of those levels simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But an allegory gives you a clue about how to solve that, if it's a good enough story. And yes, the psyche is real. I'm not saying that the psychological uh, self is a fiction as such. It is just that it is not what it appears to be. When you encounter it psychologically through your ego, your ego consciousness, it is a projection of the little ego onto this screen which is in the unconscious and the image that you get that bounces and reflects back off that screen is an enlarged version of your own psychology but it is not the bedrock of that psychology it is not the truth that's why Jung said you can't experience it directly through psychology how the hell could you mm. experience the entire genome directly through psychology it goes through transformations which are symbolic symbols are if you like zip files that you can unpack and get a hell of a lot of information out of but they appear to be quite small compressed files but that information goes right back that's the ancestral memory that's that's what we all know that's what plato meant by anamnesis all knowledge is remembering and that's the allegory of the story that as a young man to get to grips with the phenomenon of relating then you do have to access the feminine as we have projected what that means in other words we tend to relate through what others call the feminine side of a man it's not a, it's not feminine that's wrong it's a man's psychology just as the animus is no man it's it's a woman's psychology it's feminine psychology that's projected onto men there's a huge difference between the reality of the yeah. thing and what you project yeah Otherwise, you yeah. expect the man or the woman to live up to the zip file. Yes, you and they do. can't yeah. possibly they can't, do it. They can't do it. You'll no. always be disappointed if you believe that. Yeah, and always threatened if, if yeah. you encounter the dark side, which is why Von Hess is so threatening to the women in the story. Mm. He's implacable, but at the same time, he's immensely interesting and attractive oh, because yes. all of the potential that we genetically, mm. you know, as women genetically expect to meet in a, in a woman because they're programmed to anticipate that mm -hmm. is embodied in this man but at the same time he's extremely dangerous and it's the, the, the same with Lilith Lilith is, is wonderful and beautiful <coughs> and spiritual but she's a deaf demon mm. she's both of those opposites but all of the things in between just as Von Hess is and the great struggle then is the struggle of adaptation 
and that's something you have to work through as a lived thing not as a fantasy you can't do it all on the inside you have to relate you have to actively relate yeah. these these things are super important aren't they